Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to the, uh, the, the Midsummer Oxford Technology and Media Networking event. Um, last one in before we sneak off for our summer holes. Um, it's, I was joking uh, when I wrote to Brian the other day. Um, I said, oh, we'll make the title something about Ready Player One. And then I looked at his bio and realized he'd actually be involved in making it. So there you go. <laughs> I thought you knew that. I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. I didn't know that. I genuinely didn't know that. I was like, oh. Okay. Um, and I think, you know, it, in many ways, um, Oxford is continues to surprise, um, but it shouldn't because we did a fantastic tour, I think, about four years ago. We, we came up to Audio Motion and you know, it was a fabulous evening looking at everything that Audio Motion did and motion capture. It shouldn't be a surprise that this level of talent and um, you know, and global um, production I is here in Oxford, um, and um, and yet and yet it is because we perhaps you know are not aware of what's going on. And so this evening really is, um, you know, exciting in terms of new steps that uh, that Brian and the team are putting together in terms of their new studio. Uh, this happening here in Oxford, and the ambition about it is, I think, is amazing. But the other thing that I think is also quite pivotal is that the industry is shifting from the verticals that have always dominated um, television, film, and to some extent gaming as a vertical. Um, and we now have virtual reality um, um, you know, emerging finally from its from initial stages to become something of a major force in this space. And we've got several um, virtual reality specialists in the audience tonight. And all these various formats are now um, entering a world where we can actually do these as one production. We don't have to think about it as individual circles anymore. We can think about the storytelling and the concept. And I, for one, as someone who um, writes, I think that's incredibly exciting about how you can think about it and the interactivity you can do. So anyway, enough of me um, waffling on. Um, it enables me to thank very much Grant Thornton and Freeze um, for supporting us um, in, in, in the network. And to hand over to um, Brian, who's going to take us um, forward and look at some of the, the amazing work they did and the plans they've got going forward. So thank you. Cool. Hi, everybody. Um, so, thank you. Um, so, what I'm going to do then tonight is I'm going to take you through a little bit of everything. So, a little bit of background of Rebellion and who they are and what they're about. Um, touch on audio motion, some of the tech, and uh, yeah, sort of like go through, through a few bits and pieces. I've got a couple of videos which is sort of like a making of and that type of thing to give you a bit of an insight of what we do. Um, yeah, a bit of a general, general look through it all. And then obviously, hopefully, we'll have some questions, but not too technical for you. Of you. Um, but uh, we, we, we'll see how we get on anyway. So I, I should be able to cope with them, hopefully. Um, so apologies, I haven't got Ben with me, because he was um, on, the, on the list to come out. And he looks after the publishing side of Rebelli uh, Rebellion. Um, he's actually uh, been asked to be involved in the auditions for the, one of the movies we're about to do through the summer. So, um, yeah, he couldn't avoid that one, so unfortunately. So, um, anyway, um, that's that. So, Rebellion then. So, um, it's a, probably pretty much the largest independent games developer in the UK. Um, the, the head office is based in, uh, in Oxford. Um, there's about 200 people there. Um, and uh, they've got several other sites around Oxford and Wheatley, where Audio Motion are based, where, which is the company I run or have been. Um, and um, Rebellion also have, over the years, sort of picked up a few other bits along the way. So they have um, another, a, a few, this is all games development. So games studios in Warwick, Runcorn, and Wakefield. Um, so the group, um, uh, are sort of around about 315 people, I think, is the head count at the moment in the group. Um, and for the last 20 years, they've owned the IP for 2000 AD, which is the Judge Dredd, and, and, and I think there's about 700 characters within that set of IP. Uh, so there's quite a lot to work with. Um, over time, they've also bought up other bits and pieces of IP. So things like um, Roy of the Rovers, um, which um, I think is just coming up to about 65 years old, and they're just bringing him out of retirement and uh, about to relaunch him now um, with a whole series of uh, other like books, comics, graphic novels, that kind of thing. Um, and he will, I'm sure, he will progress into the other areas of media that we deal with. So. 
Uh, so Rebellion, yeah, so, so the games development side of it, they, they were initially uh, classed as a sort of gun for hire um, in games development terms. So a publisher, Sega, or Microsoft, whoever, would come along and, with a license and they'd, they'd um, put, put the game together and um, that's how they started out. <laughs> Um, they, uh, I, I don't know the details of the background because it's more Ben's department, but um, there, uh, there was a game called Alien vs. Predator, um, which goes back some years, but it's one of the games that really sort of put them on the map really in, in terms of games development. And, um, and since then, they've, they've brought out all sorts of different games. Uh, their, their main sort of um, license is uh, it's called Sniper Elite. It's a sort of World War II uh, game where you are the sniper um, and you uh, yeah, travel around uh, various uh, various environments and um, uh, take out the enemy as it were um, uh, so yeah so that's been very successful for them they have another one called zombie army trilogy um, which is uh, all good fun all the the character animation for all these type of games um, uh, are Produced by Audio Motion, so we we sort of are we are an outsourcer and to all games development, so not just Rebellion. So so Rebellion actually were a, a client of ours back in about uh, I think 15 years ago, and uh, we were part of another group of uh, games developers at the time. That got into a little bit of trouble, and Rebellion sort of like stepped in, saw the the opportunity and the the potential in the technology we had at that time. And we had about twelve cameras at the time, um, and uh, yeah, they they got involved, helped us out. We did a bit of a management buyout thing from the group, and yeah, went from there from sort of strength to strength as Audio Motion. Um, so uh, now we have something like one hundred and sixty cameras or something like that. I think. Um, kind of lost count because we've got f a few different systems and so on. Um, I'm going to refer back here to my notes because I'm trying to keep on track because I will have a tendency to sort of splitter off at different directions. So I'm trying to make sure I cover all the things I've, um, I'm trying to make, you know, trying to uh, get across. So I think that sort of concludes a, a decent amount of background of Rebellion. So, so they've dabbled in, in sort of TV and film production over the years on very sort of small sort of straight to DVD type stuff and things like that. And um, now they, you know, they've had this IP for a long time and now they're in a place where obviously they feel it's ready to, to start looking at TV and film production. So which brings us on to our, um, our new acquisition um, <coughs> over in Digcot. Um, it's, I, I don't know how much you've seen of it, but it's sort of like 220,000 square feet of, of building on a 12 acre site. Um, it's pretty immense. And um, yeah, it's, it's got lots of potential. Um, from the, from the uh, aerial view, this is the building. To give you some idea, this, this sort of length here is about 100 meters. That's a car park takes 100 cars. Um, this is an open space, which is sort of like our, one of our sort of um, interesting shape stages, or will be. This is uh, a, another building here, which we can make into a stage, and this is gonna be sort of workshops and so on. And over time, uh, we will replace these. We've got, so we're drawing up the master plan at the moment for this, and uh, there's a certain amount of development in, to, in the main building, but out the back here, we've got space for probably about four stages. I think something like twenty-five thousand square foot, that kind of size. So pretty, pretty decent stages. So, so over probably, I would estimate maybe four years, something like that. Might be quicker, depending how things take off and how like uh, successful things are. Uh, but we will basically take these areas, wipe this clean, and put in four st stages, workshops, and so on, and. The ground floor here will be like services, wardrobe, props department, that kind of thing that will service all the stages and studios. Um, we've, so with my audio motion hat on, we've worked at Pinewood, Leavesden, Shepparton, Elstree, Teddington, uh, Space Studio in Manchester. Um, yeah, a bunch of studios all over on, on various things, a lot of feature films. So in a way we're sort of, probably one of the companies in the group that is best placed to actually understand how all those other places work or not as the case may be. So Pinewood, for example, don't know if you've ever been there, but like, you know, just parking is a real 
<laughs> real nightmare. Um, and you know, it's something so simple, but you know, on a production, you'll have one person, one car. Um, and you know, depending on how many people are on the production, but that can, on day one, when everybody's trying to sign in and get through security and all the rest of it. So we're trying to build in those sort of like, you know, what if type scenarios to the whole design of the site and everything. So, so we're sort of really trying to, we're not rushing into it, I suppose, is the key thing. And we're trying to really think about it before we get in there and, and really trying to make the best use of that site. Now, Wheatley as well, is so what within the rebellion group if you like so there we all the games development which will stay in central oxford um and, and all the other places and and film the film sort of facility uh, rebellion films uh oh quite can't remember the name now um rebellion film services studios so um, sorry it's, it, i haven't been doing it long um uh <laughs> is going to be made up of Digcot and Wheatley. So it will just be a facility for use of anything. So in terms of external projects coming in, which I'm more used to dealing with, um, or internal projects, which, which Ben would be um, sort of managing and coordinating, um, between us, we'll be sort of like working the site to make sure we're getting the most from it and we're sort of controlling who's where and all that kind of thing. So, so we're not, um, because of the size of the facility and what we can offer, we, we definitely want to encourage and make sure we're bringing in, um, you know, all the other uh, sort of productions that are out there, your Netflix and uh, everybody else, um, uh, and those type of guys who we've had around the site and we've been chatting to anyway. So we're expecting to sort of see some some business coming from those guys. But long term, I think the the aim is really to ha to produce our own content. You know. Uh, rebellion hat on we own the IP you know we've got all the resources the know-how the tech the game engines and and all those kind of things the assets and everything else and now we've got the facility to actually make it in so so you know we, we're sort of all set basically to to really um, produce some some good quality content um, one of the things there is actually the tech side of things um, uh, like the game engine so uh, a good bunch of you, I guess, are going to be familiar with things like Unity and Unreal, which are the game engines that run all the, a lot of the games, a big, big percentage of the games that are out there. Um, what we're seeing at the moment, because, and, and this is partly because Audio Motion sits between film and game, so we service both industries um, and we can sort of see how they're coming closer together and how they're merging lots of tech and they're making use of lots of the similar sort of tech pipelines and ways of working and that type of thing. So because of that, um, film are really getting into using game engine as previs um, primarily. Um, and what that means is you sort of, you're able to produce all your assets and your environments and things like that. And you can sort of blueprint your film before you even go on location anywhere or, or spend lots of money. You can actually sort of like lock down lots of decisions and, and lots of things beforehand. So it really enables you sort of from an accounts point of view or the costing side of things to actually manage it so much more. Um, and creatively, you can, you, you know, directors can sort of work through lenses and, and, and all that kind of thing. So they can sort of, um, just be you know a lot more prepared before they even start shooting so um, you know there's, there's lots of benefits to, to sort of work in that way and and we're seeing that more and more now on the feature film side um, and we've been involved in that um, over over the years so we've worked um, quite a lot with uh, you, well, all, all the guys did Disney's and, and, and so on. Um, Ready Player One was a, a particularly good one because we were there for three months in Leavesden. Um, I hired two Airbnb houses for the crew and they just sort of like, because uh, um, Warner Brothers or whatever, um, you know, we're considered local, so we're not allowed to accommodation or any fees for putting our guys up. Normally we go to even Pinewood or whatever because we need our guys on site first thing and they're there for 12 hours and then, you know, whatever. Um, we'd um, uh, put them in, in local accommodation. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a moan now. So I <laughs> uh, shouldn't do that. Um, but yeah, so, uh, so basically, um, with Ready Player One, I was talking about that. Um, so we uh, not only supplied our crew, because we're quite a small team of people uh, that work audio motion. So, so the, the head count is 12 people there. Um, we'd have all those guys plus another, I don't know, 15 or so 
freelance people we bring in um, to go to set and work through the whole process. Ready Player One was a particularly good one because what they did was they uh, captured, uh, did a regular sort of motion capture, performance capture shoot. Uh, uh, personally, I don't see any difference between motion capture and performance capture because everything is a performance. Um, that's what we're capturing. Um, so yeah, however you want to put it. Um, Ready Player One captured facial animation with a head cam, body and finger animation, uh, worked through the whole scenes, pre-visited in real time on screens as the character, so your actor would see themselves as the character on screen in the environment they're supposed to be play like acting in. Um, and then we would take that, uh, that data or that captured, uh, that we captured, sorry, um, and process that data. Um, and we take that through probably three pieces of software. So we'd, so we'd sort of clean up the data. We'd take it into like a 3D package like Maya or something like that. Then we take it into a game engine like Unity, um, put all the lights in, the effects and, and all that kind of thing, um, and then take it out. So the, your director would then look at it as rushes. So old school, just either see it end of the day if he's lucky, but probably the next morning, he would go into, so we had a separate capture system like a small one, that di the director would go in there and he'd either have a virtual camera, which is basically like a little screen with, the, with a 3D view on it. He's being tracked by our cameras. So as he walks around in that space, he can see, he can walk in amongst the actors, if you like, on the screen. So um, it's harder to explain than it is to just do. Um, but he'd have a, a menu of, of, uh, of, on his, of controls that he can, um, I suppose a bit like the VR experience, so you can sort of like uh, fly through that scene. You could be on the shoulder of the actor and you can walk around in front of his face and look right at him. Uh, you could be like God mode, so you could look over the whole landscape and it's t tiny and down there. You could be an ant and you could look up at the, everybody and that kind of thing. So it gives, you, it gives you all the things you can get out of VR. So it puts you in that virtual space, but it's the performance you directed the day before. So because he can go into that place, he could also do VR. It's, it's actually not a lot of difference. Um, but when you go into that space, you can go in there and you can actually, it's probably more so in VR actually, but you could actually, on your sort of like menu of, uh, of uh, tools, you can actually write in the scene. So if you want to sort of move a tree a little bit that way, you can sort of either write it in there or put an arrow next to it or whatever. You can, um, if you know, you can do anything you like because you're in virtual world. So it's so the, the sort of like the tools and the ability to sort of really get creative in there is that that's where the real drive is for the tech. I think all that sort of you know all that what that opens up to you as a director. Um, is amazing and and as you get to see as people sort of develop the tools and stuff that you can use for that is is just going to be amazing and um, what we're doing with Disney is we're actually bringing in up at Wheatley here is bringing in some quite high name or big name uh, directors and actually just showing them the tech showing them how it works what they can do what they can get from it and that kind of thing because it's the sort of tech you really need to get your hands on if and especially if you're old school director um, you're, you know, you, it's this sort of, this sort of newfangled tech business you don't really want to get involved with because you know how you want to do it and that's how you do it. But once you actually get in there and get your hands on it and you can start to see the benefits of it, I think, you know, it's it's not a steep learning curve. It's it's creative. It's getting in there and, and actually doing it and using it. Once you've done that, then you can start. Then it starts triggering off all more questions and 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 that sort of creative side of you to, to sort of do more with it and, and make more from it. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Let me just check, see where I've got to, because um, I'll pass, that's cool. All right, OK. I'll give you a little bit of blurb. I'll come back to that in a minute, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit of blurb about the IP and so on from, um, should we do that? Actually, no. Let's carry on with the tech side, because that's the bit I know. <laughs> Let's do that. I'll tell you what, actually, I, I, I'll, I'll play you a video, which is a bit of a, like a making of. Um, and it, it, it's actually for, uh, um, well, it's, it, um, it's a game studio, um, but it was a film. So um, technically, it was a great film. I'll leave it there. Um, um, so let me actually, well, I've got this on screen. So this is what I'm thinking to try and do at Didcot. Sorry, I know I've darted back again. Just stick with me. 
So this was the, the stages that Dick Carton a workshop in the middle. This is actually 30,000 square foot and this is 15 or something like that. We were having conversations about what, what format. None of it's locked down yet. There'd be a perimeter road and things like that. So th this isn't the final thing, but this is just a top down. I did have a 3D version of this, but of course I lost the connection and now I can't show you. But, um, but I had some nice cameras set up so we could click through and it flew you all through the building and everything, which, um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, that's that. Right, I'm gonna play this video now for you. Here at the um, motion capture set, the setting is totally professional and it's, it looks amazing. The facilities and stuff you can get over here, like the size, the scale of this is just something that you can't really do in Tokyo. There aren't, there aren't any places this big. Here we go, let's roll the This project involved a lot of new challenges and the first obviously um, big challenge for us is um, to hire an actors to do um, all the 3D scanning and also the motion capture. It's not very different to doing conventional green screen shooting, except you're capturing characters and shapes rather than the actual actors themselves. Two hours. We must wait for it. It's really cool when you see how we're filming, how we're doing the dialogue, how immediately you see how the actors here are transformed. You can see in real time into the characters they're playing. So you've got 60 or 70 cameras on this setup. Basically, they triangulate where the markers are that are on the actor. They track his movements throughout the space, and then we can reconstruct that. Once we're in that virtual environment, then we can spin around and view it from any angle. Uh, it's really useful for the director, so if he wants to frame a shot from a certain angle or, or check different views of, of that scene, um, it gives him the ability to do so in real time. The director, um, Takashi, has been very, very great. Um, he really um, loves at the new challenges. We could have done everything in Japan, but because he wanted to obviously try to get new audience, especially in the West, we decided to get Western actors. He wanted to use the Western actors to make sure he got the nuances and the gestures and all that kind of, all the minutiae that go into the characters. He wanted it to be natural for a Western audience. Motion capture誰かと一緒にコラボレーションするっていう意味合いでもあると思うんですよ。そういった形で、やっぱり人間っていうものを表現していかないと、その一人が考えることで、あの、いろんな人の感情を細かい感情が表現できるかって言ったら、僕はそ
And imagination really is the big thing, not only in acting, but also in performance capture. Um, you have to be able to be a little loose with your lateral thought of where the environment is, because it can change. Some people might find that a little difficult because they might want to physically see the environment, not just see it on the screen. But um, I think a lot of people get used to very quickly the idea of using your imagination to fill in the world based off the screen you're looking at or based off any of the art concepts you've been given. And after you get that knack, it actually becomes second nature. That feels okay. No, that's okay. Have we done it? Yeah. <laughs> we have lift off. With motion capture as opposed to film, so you kind of have to do the big expressions as if it's theater again. But if you're wearing a head cam, you've got a camera here. So it's this, your brain goes, there's a camera there, so I've got to do nothing. And then you're like, no, but I've got to do big stuff so they can track it all and... We have the headset on so that they can know our expressions, like every point, every wrinkle on our face, everything can be as realistic as our face. It is hard to get the fine line between overacting and underacting in motion capture, so it is a bit of a skill to master. And if I don't play, it's ready for all. 20 miles to the set. We are working 24 7 live in Tokyo. Actually, because of the time difference and everything, they are watching remotely. They are with us for the whole journey, even though they're not here, physically not here. It's a global collaboration, what we're doing here today. It's not easy, but um, it's fun. That's kind of what I was just saying. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that gives you probably a little bit more information there than me just talking at you. Um, so, um, okay. I think, so back, back to Digcot then, is obviously a lot of the stuff I talk about is gonna be motion capture because I've been doing it 20 years. Um, so I kind of know that quite well. Um, how that's gonna be integrated into feature films and TV series and everything. Um, that's just going to get more and more. Um, we're seeing a lot more interest from TV now, which TV was sort of like never interested in motion capture. It was too expensive, it was too slow, you couldn't get it quick enough, da, 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 whatever. So it's like, right, okay, we can do a few commercials, music videos and that sort of thing, that's fine. Um, now we're looking at sort of, because we can do things in real time, we can actually have an actor um, stood behind the curtain driving a CG character presenting to you and he can actually have a camera back here so he can see your reactions, he can actually get eye contact, he can pick on you and everything else. We can actually do all that in real time, you know, and all that's very possible. Um, so, you know, all, all those sort of types of things. So you're going to see a lot more of that and you're probably not even going to realize you're going to be seeing a lot more of that there's some some videos i've got here i've got a whole bunch of videos but i'll like be here all night but um quite a lot of it now because of the actual quality of the um the detail of, of facial animation and that kind of thing now is so good that you i i, I would argue you couldn't actually tell the difference who was real who was not um and yeah I mean, that opens it up to all sorts of things that you can, uh, how you can, you know, in, in, sort of bring it into your tech, into your pipeline, into your project. Um, so, there's, so there's lots and lots of opportunities coming up. One of the key things at Digcot as well, actually, is um, we're building our own VFX department. Um, and yes, um, uh, admittedly, it's going to be for based on our own projects and using our own assets, but essentially it's going to be as part of the resource of the studio. So that would be sort of like 100 strong. So in that, in that main building at, at Digcot, um, in terms of headcount, at the moment I'm looking at um, probably something in the region of about 300 people. Um, so that's sort of like, that's the sort of numbers we're looking at for, you know, employment into the area, bringing that, you know, building those sort of like creative hub of people that we're going to need for that because that's not you know we're going to that's going to be a tough call for us to sort of build that um that team you know but hopefully based on sort of like the ip we've got and the, and the projects we can bring to it um and the tech um you know hopefully we can draw in a lot more people so that's one of the, going, to, going to be one of the sort of a challenge for us to sort of try and 
you know, get, get, bring all those people out of London or whatever. They don't live there anymore anyway, so they will live around this way. So, so we're, we're going we're gonna to sort of like try and create more around that area. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's a big sort of uh, big push for us and what we're going to be trying to aim to, to grow and, and, and work with all your various sort of creative industries and, and the like to, to build. So um, I don't know, where are we up to on times? Okay. Do you want to? Should we? Should we do some questions? Anybody got any questions or anything? So. The tech is that is that unique to what you're doing in the world or UK or? Uh, no. Well, no. It's not really. Um, so, so, so the question was like, is the tech um, unique to us for the benefit of the camera? Um, so, no, it's not. Is a straight answer. However. Um, I started talking about game engines, and I mentioned earlier that we had our own game engine. So, so Rebellion actually, they're, 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 the game engine that all their games are based on, and that sort of drives all the physics and everything else for the game, is their own tech, is their own sort of development, their own IP. So, so with the VFX department that we're going to be building there, um, initially um, we need to centre that around things like Unity and Unreal because they are the sort of two big products out there that a lot of people are using. So if we want to appeal to sort of work coming in, we're going to have to know how they work and, and be able to integrate with those. Um, and, and we do that already. I mean, like as Audio Motion, we, you know, we, we stream through both of those, we but use both those engines, they're fairly standard. Um, uh, but um, the development that's going to go on at Rebellion is to obviously base it all around their own tech Again, it's it's about control and it's about you know managing your own content and producing it all. So, so there is an element of it which will be, um, but as a, as an offering to the outside world, we we will be compatible with all sort of like major products that are being used currently in film production. Right. Okay. Right, you thought about having like a, your own channel. You said TV's been a little bit slow to the party. You thought about doing your own. Yeah. Well, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. I mean, um, so Jason, so one of the brothers, so Jason and Chris Kingsley are the, the guys that own Rebellion. So Jason runs his own YouTube channel of Modern Histories, uh, which I think he's in talking to the BBC at the minute about. Um, I'm not sure. I guess it. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm assuming it will come, um, but at the moment it's it's not on the agenda, I guess, because we're probably focused more on feature film. That type of thing, but yeah, I mean, it's the thing is about all our assets and, and all the sort of know-how we've got. It can be applied to all the different mediums. So from game, TV, film, VR, whatever's next, YouTube channels, whatever you know. You could, you could almost force the hand a little bit, though. Yeah. Yeah. TV would be coming to you rather than. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. It, uh, to me, in, in some ways, which is a lovely problem to have, but there's almost too many opportunities. It's like, you know, which way do you want to go? You need to sort of like channel it somewhere and focus where you want to be because if you, like, once you start sort of coming up with those things, yeah, you, you could sort of probably not get, you know, too many things to go at really almost. So, yeah. And do you need public funding for the difficult um, facilities at all? No. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm sure. Uh, public funding. Well, I'm sure we'll. Um, you know, we'll we'll uh, develop all, all sorts of things there that will involve all the. What coming to us? Yes. No. I, well, I'm. I'm not personally. I'm not aware of it. Um, there's. I'm sure those talks are going on. Um, so yeah, th you know, there's lots of initiatives all over the place. So yeah, I won't be party of those conversations probably at the minute. So yeah. What sort of um, time schedule are you looking at in terms of you know when we get the plan in? Organized, uh, you quite sure. Well, the, um, uh, okay. So so the planning side for Didcot, um, obviously uh, in talks with the council anyway. Um, and trying to sort of develop that because we've only really sort of just got to the stage where we've got a master plan put together to sort of know the direction we're going with it. Um, obviously that the sort of 
we're only really just starting talking to the council about those type of things because until we really knew what we wanted, it's, you know, you can't really have that conversation yet. So um, timescales for getting people in there. So the, uh, the VFX type um, uh, uh, department, if you like, um, we're aiming to start that. That will start in August, or well, the head of that will start in August. And we're looking to sort of build a team of, I think, 10 to 12 by the end of the year. Um, and then that will go on. Uh, the space we have allocated for at the minute is about 100 people. But how that, you know, that will probably change over time and <coughs> potentially used elsewhere and see that how that evolves. So as, oh, sorry, one sec. Yeah, the one lady behind, yeah. about the guy being behind the screen and yep. the there's an issue around international academic conferences um, they're hugely consuming of air miles because all these academics do <coughs> genuinely need to get together and do some face time yep. to progress some of the technology that they're working on yep. is, there, is anyone doing any work in this area I have seen a keynote by by hologram but it was it was somebody saying the same things that he always says anyway. Stood <laughs> there being a sort of a pinky bluish glowing hologram um, was kind of intriguing and saved him going to Australia, but I think feels added a whole lot. Is anyone using this stuff for events? So, and so like video conferencing tech, yeah, really? Uh, the, the thing about a conference is people are doing FaceTime, but they're also flying all over the world and we're going to have to stop doing it. Yeah. So, is anyone using this stuff to create sort of bit more than virtual reality? Virtual people. Virtual yeah, virtual conference. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I'm sure there is yeah. technology for that. Yes, yeah, there are. It's yeah. a British company, and I can't remember the name, but a friend of mine has just joined them as a CTO. He lives in Los Angeles. Yeah. Well, no, exactly. <coughs> and, and they basically have a platform, which is precisely what you're describing. It's a, it's a, uh, a, beat, a business to business platform for. VR conferencing, so it's not only just video, mm -hmm. it's, it's so you're in the room with the other people. Is so you can use it for prep, so the sort of thing that Brian was describing. Yeah, when was, when I was thinking, oh, now that's the other yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, if I could remember it, I'd tell you. Okay, the well, we'll uh, find it then. Yeah. It's just yeah. Just Go on. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Right. We'll, we'll have a chat. Hold on. <laughs> Go on. Can I ask you a question about yeah. the relationship between. <clears throat> Uh, the actors that you use and the sort of um, synthetic spins that you create. Yeah. Do, do the actors have any of the rights of, of traditional actors? Yeah. And are actors going to get displaced completely by synthetic spins in due course? No, not at all. <coughs> you, you've, you, you need the performance, you need the raw material. Yeah. And that's only going to come from that. The, the, yeah, the thing about, so the technology, very briefly, is from a medical background. So it's gait analysis and that type of thing. So it's really precise. Our cameras, the reason our, our, the sort of, our cameras are, are like, um, or the detail and everything is so good is because of that sort of like, the detail comes from the cameras. But what that means is you get every nuance from the actor. So uh, like the amount of actors or, or, or dancers especially, if you show them a piece of animation of a dancer, they will identify that even if they just see dots on the screen That's moving true. they know exactly who that is because they get paid accordingly so they <coughs> yeah so so there's a whole there's a whole bunch of stuff around this um, so people um, if you're getting their likeness so to, a lot of times they mention the the facial scanning of the actor yeah. so um, more often than not now people actors do get scanned and they, you can see that it's their likeness, it's that actor playing that part. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's definitely um, situations where people are getting, you know, uh, uh, are either signing away their rights, which is obviously the way a lot of things try to go, um, but that's sort of coming in the background now where people are actually retaining that. Um, and there's uh, one of the actresses who's also casting, di uh, well, she's not an actress anymore, but she used to be somebody we work with a lot, uh, she's a casting director now. Um, she's working with BAFTA and, and like Equity and all those kind of organisations to protect the rights of actors in this 
type of tech. Yeah, sort of framework. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously it's a big issue. Uh, but the, the other thing about that then, or the other side of that, is you'll have um, one actor, um, or sorry, one character, one CG character, played by yeah, half a dozen people. So, you know, um, it, it sort of depends what it is and, and what the profile is and the budget of it and, and all that kind of stuff. It, it sort of comes into play then. Yeah. Yes, John. Um, can I ask, uh, with your plan, how much, uh, what's the proportion between uh, production, you being a production company making the Rebellion Studio uh, products and how, what percentage do you think would be external work? Cool, yeah. Um, so so the, the, the sort of balance between external work and Rebellion projects um, initially um, I guess I you know 80 20 in favor of external work because it's all getting into the swing of it like rebellion are a games developer you know we're the only company in the group that actually deals in film and TV and all that kind of thing so so although they've got the tech and the assets and everything else you've got to work like build into that sort of like ability to sort of you know produce your own stuff uh, you know your own content um so yeah so i think it'd be 80 20 in favor of the external work and where it goes from there i don't know i mean like you know the the goal or the target if you like obviously is probably the opposite way but in reality i think that take quite a long time to get there because i think we can as a studio facility we can produce you know, if we're just sort of like working through, you know, a, a feature film, um, you know, three months in the studio is is a feature film, a lot of post, you know, massive chunk of post work to do, um, unless they do virtual production, which like reduces that and actually does a lot more up front. But again, from a facilities point of view, I think, you know, we can handle that. And you're always going to have other post houses involved, things like that. I don't think you're going to have it, it, yeah, um, it's a it's a job to answer. <laughs> I just wondered about but, how much it was a facility, or if it was just pretty much going to be a production. Yeah, no, it's a, it's got to be a facility because I, I I think they're going to have to have a pretty long list of stuff to to produce, and I don't think they've got enough time as the rest of the group to actually do that unless we make it much much bigger. Uh, uh, David, you just mentioned virtual production. I know you've been exploring that. I think it'd be interesting for us all to hear what you mean by that. So, I mean, as I understand it, it means a lot of production of uh, Game of Thrones, etc., etc., use a huge amount of of the techniques that you're talking about in pre-production yeah. to plot what they're going to shoot yeah. efficiently. But I know you mentioned virtual production. That's about actually using these techniques to create the shots itself. Yes. <laughs> um, virtual production, um, yeah, so where does virtual production fit in, in the grand scheme of things? Um, I think that's probably one of our strongest assets from the place we're coming from. Because we're coming from a game development environment, we, like, because of that, you sort of developed lots of ways of working. Games industry, from our point of view, uh, audio motion, um, games industry have pretty much always been in front of the the film guys for years really i mean like we were doing virtual production techniques and virtual camera and that kind of thing eight years ago um with games industry you know the tech wasn't quite uh, it's a bit clunky because it wasn't sort of quite as smooth as it is now but you know it all the all the techniques were being used then so um so yeah it's, it's nice now that all the software the thing has changed is all the bits elements of the software and the whole pipeline have all actually sort of come into a place where it's actually pra you know production ready it's ready to go it actually works smoothly it's reliable all that kind of stuff um virtual production uh, there's 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 quite a lot of variants of it um so there's sort of like you know there's live action people on a green screen in a virtual environment there's virtual characters with real character live action characters ready player one's an example of that um, in a live action environment, live actor, virtual actor, um, all being captured at the same time. So, so there's lots of sort of different ways of using it and, and making it work for, you, for, your, for your project. Um, uh, so I think, I mean, it's, it's the biggest thing that's going to change filmmaking 
sort of now, basically. It's, gonna, it's just a thing we're going to see more of. It's going to be employed all over the place, which you wouldn't expect it, period dramas and things like that. You, it's going to be all in, all in amongst that, and you wouldn't even realize. Um, so that's the thing that's going to change the way, way things are produced right now. And I think it's going to have quite a big effect. I mean, we're seeing it with Disney and that. We, we worked on about four movies last year with Disney. Um, there's a movie coming out next year where uh, we did exactly that. We, we pre the whole film in real time um, with a single character um, in a virtual environment with various other animals. Um, and um, yeah, uh, it's being used right now. It's, it's, it's going to tip it on its head a little bit, I think. So you're going to have a lot of lot more pre-production um, and things are going to have to be locked down and, and agreed and, and, and the sort of process set up at that point. You do, you actually get to the shoot and, and it makes it far more efficient, as I mentioned earlier. And then there's also less time in post. So it's sort of, it's going to affect every element of the, of the filmmaking process. Um, uh, and and you still got the ability to sort of like whatever you've agreed up here in post, you can still change it because it's all virtual. So yeah, it's it's so an exciting time. Less money, so it yeah. Producers will benefit a lot. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, in that video you just showed us, you uh, showed uh, what from Square Enix, Lizzie Palmer, uh, East developer. Um, I was wondering in this new studios you're opening, if you're primarily focusing on your own kind of like IPs and producing that, or will you continue working with uh, film companies on their own projects? Uh, well, th yeah, uh, that, that's cool. I mean, that comes back to John's question as well, is the mix between external work versus internal, if you like, our, our internal IP. Um, I think there's always going to be a need to do external work. And, 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 we, uh, and again, from the motion capture side, we've worked with you know, Japan, um, Russia, Iceland, US, you know, there's, there's no boundary of where, who we can work with or what we do. We can do it rem remotely and that kind of thing. So that's always, good. there's always going to be a need for that. And, and we're always going to be there to do that because there's not many, there's not actually many companies in the world that like have the sort of tech know-how and ability of, that we've got. So like for, um, Ridley Scott's Gods and Kings, we captured horses and chariots. Um, and we had about, we went to a riding school and we had um, around about 150 cameras um, set up as a capture system, uh, 10 horses and, and yeah, um, there's probably only people in the States, they're, they're the only people that could have done that other than us. So, you know, we're in a strong position right now where we can, like the scale of things that we can produce is pretty impressive so you know we need to sort of like capitalize on that and, and make the most of it and that's for anybody that comes through the door really um you yeah, know yeah carl um in terms of the internal ip what you're developing yourself will that very much rely on let's say the existing titles and the existing ip that um uh, rebellion has licensed around 2018 and so on or are you planning to also develop your own um, yeah no genre, the genre. yeah no um, definitely developing our own is you know I mean having that set of IP that's established with the fan base and 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 stories and, and writers and everything else that go along with that you know that that's great and and everything else but out of that as well I mean you know we'd be foolish not to create new you know brand new sort of characters the whole sort of games so uh the game side of it with sniper elite they're the lead character is carl um in there and i'm pretty sure he would be made into some kind of you know he'll have a a, a show or, or an animated series or something because they've got the assets already they've got the characters established there's a fan base through the game you know that's their own ip that they've sort of developed over time so why wouldn't you just carry on that development because you, you're halfway there with everything else so so yeah we, we're always going to be looking at new new ip as well yes sir. is the company thinking of uh, selling some of the data to capture in the motion capture uh sell it as in uh, like a library asset library as raw data sets so for example um you could use the facial expressions to do machine learning to identify emotions. 
So or computers nowadays can write poetry and even write stories. Maybe they could even <coughs> write their own films. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we, we've worked with a few companies that, that are doing that. So as Audio Motion, that is. So, so Audio Motion is, a, is like an outsource company. So we provide character animation. So if somebody comes along and they want character animation, they're going to pay for the actors to come along and do it. We we do that. I well, mean, you, saying you, you could sell your ten horses and your chariots. You've already done. Well, well you you've got the same horses and chariots already captured, and we'll have that. You one. could if you didn't have a whacking great big contract with Fox. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so every That's project. A different horses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you know, your Disney's, your Warner's, your Fox, yeah. and all those guys. The contract there, you know, I, I have a legal person that just go, I get the contract and I go, right, there you go, you deal with that. And so Ready Player One, we got to the point where I said, could you please pay your deposit or else we're not turning up. Um, and because they waited so late in the day to give us the contract. And I said, well, OK, that's fine, you can do that to me, but I'm still going to have to get it checked. And then we had to go back with about three or four changes in it. And, you know, that just takes time. And, and, you know, and I've, I'd ask them up front to say, I'm sure you're probably going to hit me with a contract at some point. Can you make sure we don't leave it too late? So we actually, hit, that was a real situation where I'm talking to the producer saying, can you please sort this out because it's going to cause you a problem. But like, no, a real problem, you, know, you know, I don't mind who you are. If, if that's not in place, we're not doing that. So it's, you know, and then some, I've been doing it too long probably, but I mean, it's, you have to be like that with people because, especially big companies, I think tend or can have a tendency to take advantage of the smaller company. Um, but it depends what you're offering, I guess. If they can't get it out of swear, you know, what are they going to do? So anyway, yes, sir. You mentioned uh, earlier on that uh, the gate of the actors is actually very specific to the actor sometimes. Yeah. You can see that in the data. Uh -huh. uh, is that data subject to GDPR? Um, oh, um, oh, I can't. Uh, GDPR. Oh. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. No. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. It's all right. It's just as soon as you hear those letters, you think, oh, oh. I'll go back to the contract, but you are you are obligated on GDPR to. Not, not so no, store no, personal no, identifiable no, no, information it's securely. Different. It's a performance. It's going to be an yes, equity yes. style contract. Right, OK, there you go. As people know so them more mean? than me. Huh? No. I'm not familiar with those contracts. Basically, the, the product of the performance, the work, is sold by the, by the performer to the producers. Uh -huh. And uh, there are obviously lots of specific conditions to that, getting paid for one, and, uh, and maybe earning some royalties. But basically, the, the, the product of that performance is what is being sold by the performer, just as any actor in any film. So it, you know, there's no, there's no, that personal intellectual property in their performance is what they are selling. I think I'm not really talking about IP, I'm talking about identity information. You're selling well, that? Yeah. yeah, you're selling that too. The, the, the well, they're selling their, yeah, they're selling their identity so you, to you, you audio emotion. emotion yeah, but you can, you, you can, and they sorry. don't care about identity. We should, we should probably use the thing. The we, we can go back in time to something like, um, for example, Clint Eastwood. Is, is Clint Eastwood's information his, or when he plays a character like Dirty Harry, you know, does that belong to the film company? How does that work? I mean, this is not a new problem. This is okay. kind of going back, this goes back quite a long time. And mm. I, I imagine that sort of historical contractual law probably covers it, but I'm not a lawyer. Yeah, a no. performance is an IP, it is an intellectual property that can be bought and sold, and that is what's happening here. Yeah. And the data is just one form to represent this IP. A photograph would be a way to represent the IP here's data parts. See, and that's why I would just give it to the legal guy. <laughs> go, you deal with that, because that's going to go on for a while. But that's the producer's problem. No. That's, I mean, in the case yeah. of motion, okay. as a subcontractor, basically, yeah. the expression, but it is, yeah, yeah. Then, then the producer must ensure that all of the rights in the performances as a piece of intellectual property or whatever you like to call it, the likeness, the right to use the likeness in all forms of exploitation are inherent in any engagement agreement for an actor. Okay. And this is a performer or dancer or right. Sorry, well, sorry, if I can. Digital identity. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> right. Um, I was going to just show you a, a show reel. 
if that's okay. Great. And then we'll go upstairs. And, <laughs> and carry on up there if that's all right. Is that okay? Yeah? All right, okay. So. so much Brian that was a fantastic and amazing way to finish as well that's an oh. amazing catalogue of work um, just remains to thank you very much for coming over and sharing the story with us this evening very exciting times looking forward to see things develop yeah indeed and, um, and also looking forward to see how it changes the landscape um, yeah going forward yeah in yeah terms of what's, what's coming both in games and film and VR yeah um, so thank you very much indeed pleasure for coming this evening thank, thank you, you.